Hello and welcome to the Feast of Pentecost, also called the Feast of Weeks, called Pentecost, which means 50. And there's even a verse in Exodus, I think it's 23, that talks about the Feast of the Harvest or Feast of Harvest. And so those are all the terms used in the Bible, Pentecost in the New Testament, meaning 50. And so we counted 50 days from the day after the weekly Sabbath that comes right around and in the Days of Unleavened Bread. So thank you for coming to our site, to Light on the Rock. I'm Philip Shields, host of the site, and uh, that we dedicated to God our Father, to His glory, and of course to Yeshua. He is the light of the world, John 8, 12. He is the rock, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 4. And so He is the rock upon which we build our house and our site. Thank you for coming. Father in heaven, we ask your divine blessing and help on this day to just Fill us with your Holy Spirit as we listen, as I speak. Inspire me, use your Holy Spirit, and also to those who are hearing. We commit this beautiful, beautiful day to you, dear Father in heaven, and to you, Yeshua, our Savior, our beloved. We thank you both. We thank you in Yeshua's mighty name. Of and by through your Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you join me? Let's go on a journey together. Are you like me? I love the um, uh, time travel movies if they don't get too bizarre or too weird, and if the language and things that they're showing are okay. But let's go back in a time machine, back to maybe a couple of weeks, two or three weeks before Passover, the year Christ died, almost 2,000 years ago. Now, we're going to be dressed. I forget the name of the show now. My wife should be here to tell me. Uh, there was a show we watched where they would dress in the period, uh, period dress of the time, and they would land in town, and, you know, they would fit right in. So you and I fit right in. We're dressed like they are. We're, we know Hebrew. We know Aramaic. Maybe even some of us know Greek. I don't, but, but let's say for the sake of our discussion here. And can you imagine being in Jerusalem almost 2,000 years ago? So starting a few weeks before uh, Passover, uh, we go to Lazarus' home. He's the brother of Martha and Mary, and he's sick, and he dies. You know the story in John 11. And it, so it happens in a relatively short time before Passover. He dies, we're, and we go there to see what's going to happen. We know how it ends, um, and, and yet we're still, we're still right in the middle of everything. And so... We watch as Yeshua arrives. Uh, we see Mary and Martha going to him. And we see them take away the stone. So many times there's a stone that blocks our vision of what really God's able to do. And so they took away the stone and Yeshua said, Lazarus, come forth. And let me read it in John 11, 43 and 44. John 11, and when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died, been dead several days now, wasn't this fourth day already? He who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes. He's still bound. Can you imagine the hairs in the back of your neck as you see this thrilling, exciting resurrection of a guy who's, you know, trying to move. He's all bound. He's, and it says his face is wrapped with a cloth. Wrapped, you know, <laughs> And Jesus said to them, I think a little comically, probably, come on, you guys, loose them. Let them go. Imagine how exciting that would have been to have been there. Many believed in, in him because of this, but some went and told the Pharisees and the chief priests what had happened, and they began conspiring to his, for his death. Yeshua, in the meantime, takes off at the end of John 11 to go to a place called Ephraim across the, the Jordan where he has a few days of respite. Now, you and I in our time machine witness his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. We witness him tossing out the money changers, cleansing the temple area, so to speak, uh, that had become a house of thieves in his own, in the area, of, you know, not inside the building, but outside the building. And we watch uh, some days later from our vantage point on Mount of Olives after his last supper. And we knew that he was going to go to Gethsemane. So we're watching from 
a vantage point there, and we watch as he's arrested. We watch as he heals the man whose ear had been cut off. We watch as before that how Judas had come up and kissed him and how he said his very first word to this man who was betraying him, representing the nation or the tribe of Judah. That's what his name was, Judah, Yehuda. We read the word Judas, that's a Greek form of Judah. And so Judah, Judas kisses him and Yeshua's first word is friend. Friend, why have you come? Though we know what to expect, some moments after that we could hear the scourging, the, the slashing, the anguish, gasps, even screams of our master as his skin is ripped apart. We watch him, after seeing Pilate and Herod and all of that, we watch him carry as far as he could his heavy cross. And we watch him, and we were there watching and hearing the pounding of the rusty nails into his hands and his ankles and the blood loss and everything else. We turned our eyes, we couldn't watch, as the Roman thrust his spear into his side and out came blood and water. We wished we could do something, we couldn't. All we could do was watch. We watched before that how he had kindly asked John to take his mother away and to adopt her as his mother. Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. We watched as Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus took him down and took him to be entombed. That was Passover day, just before sundown. And that evening, who could celebrate? It was very, very hard. A pall hung over all believers in Yeshua, a pall. We knew he'd be resurrected, we did, but, and they should have known, because he told them, he told them. But we watched, and watched their anguish, and wished we could give them inspiration. Their hero was dead. Their savior was dead. But sure enough, three days and three nights later, we come and we find on the first day of the weeks that his tomb is empty. We checked it out ourselves later on before it was sealed with guards again. Christ went to heaven to be accepted of the Father on our behalf, on behalf of the rest of the harvest. And we were there. When he came back down later on and talked to the 12 disciples, the 11 disciples, and we were there, and when he appeared to various ones and finally to part of the 500 people who saw him, who saw him rise up to heaven just days, just a few days before Pentecost. A man who was flesh and blood had died, had been resurrected to glory and was rising up in the air. People had been around him for about 40 days. Pentecost was coming up. I'm giving all of you this to remind you that that first Pentecost in the New Covenant times was a very, very unsettled time. Thrilling times, but unsettled time. To watch your hero be crucified, to be killed, to be resurrected, seen by some, but not all. A lot of rumors going around, a lot of emotions being yanked back and forth, up and down for weeks. You even heard people asking, if, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They still thought he was coming to be king at that time. Yeshua focused on the coming baptism, the coming immersion of the Holy Spirit in just a while. Then right then and there, while, he was, while they watched in Acts 1 verse 9, you can read all this in Acts 1. He was taken up in a cloud and finally received up into the heavens out of their sight. And then read the rest of Acts 1. The early believers composed of men and women were in harmony. They, they picked, God picked, uh, a replacement for Judas or Judah. And that man's name was Matthias. There were 120 who were there according to Acts 1 verse 15. And, and God led them to select Matthias, as I said. Then... Probably a couple days later, a few days later, on Pentecost, they were all of one accord. They were all in one accord waiting together. And at 9 o'clock in the morning, Peter said, it's only 9 in the morning, we're not drunk, later on in Acts chapter 2. So at 9 in the morning, 
it says that, uh, uh, that, anyway, Jesus, let me go back a step. Yeshua had said, you're going to be immersed. You've got to stay here in Jerusalem until you're immersed and baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, there are many clear examples that this was not the first time people were given the Holy Spirit. Lots and lots of the prophets clearly had God's Spirit. They were told so. Joseph certainly were told so. Moses, Joshua, and so on. And, uh, and, 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 and we know that even John the Baptist. But John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit from inside his mother's womb. His mother Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, Luke 1.41. His father Zacharias the priest was filled with the Holy Spirit, Luke 1.67. This is all before the uh, day of Pentecost. And but, so, but in the New Testament, the, the first time large groups of people received the Holy Spirit was on the day of Pentecost. Although numerous individuals here and there received the Holy Spirit. When I say numerous, I don't mean thousands, but I mean quite a few. Let's read what happens now. In Acts 2, verses 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord. They were all together in one place. 120 of them, according to Acts 1, verse 15. And there suddenly came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. I mean, if you've been in mighty winds, uh, I've been in hurricane, not, not four or five or three, but, but one, one and a half or two. And uh, the, the sound of the wind is mighty, it's strong, frightening. I've, I, I've been in a tornado when, I was a tor uh, when we were traveling in the south with my father and uh, at least nearby, one was nearby, a rushing mighty wind. Imagine the sound of that. And it filled the house where they were sitting, 9 a.m. at the time of prayer. The other time of prayer was 3 p.m. And there appeared to them divided tongues of fire, as of fire, and one, of, and, and one sat on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other languages, in other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance, as the Spirit led them, as the Spirit helped them to speak. Now picture the scene, you're there. Okay, we, we're part of the 120 in this case, in, in my picture, okay? And powerful hurricane-like force wind. I'm, I'm not saying we feel the wind. It's the sound of that tornado-type wind. People from outside rush inside. What's going on in there? It's so loud. People from far away, people from outside could, could, could hear it. How exciting. They were filled with God's Spirit, His nature, His seed, His power, His mind. What He is. Filled with it. Wow. I'd love to be filled with God's Spirit. I don't know if I am. I want to be. I pray for it. Do you pray for it? Do you realize God the Father wants to give you and me his Holy Spirit wants to. He says in Luke 11, verse 13, If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit if you would just ask him to those who ask him? And there's a verse, you know, in James 4, verse 2, where, where, where uh, James says the reason you don't have more is you're not asking. You know, Yeshua had taught to ask Ask, and you'll receive your answer. Seek, and you'll find it. Knock, and it'll be open to you. James in 4 verse 2, I think it is, James 4 verse 2 says, the reason you don't have more is you're not asking. So, I mean, sometimes we get critical of Adam and Eve for not going to the tree of life. We have the tree of life right there. And as often as we want to eat of it and ask, and ask, and ask for the Holy Spirit. Are you? Did you ask of the Holy Spirit today? Yesterday, the day before, the day before that. Maybe in the evening, the daytime, the mid-afternoon. I'm trying to do it many times a day. I'd love to be filled with the Holy Spirit so I could better serve God's people and serve Him and be a better man, a better husband, a better person. So regularly pray for that every single time you get a chance. I keep asking for it more, and I read how so many of the early believers had this Holy Spirit and were filled with the Holy Spirit. Like I said, John the Baptist had the Holy Spirit from conception, from his mother, from, from, I keep saying that, from his mother's womb. Okay, he was, he was conceived by Zacharias, but from his mother's womb he was filled with the Holy Spirit. 
And these people, we just read it, Acts 2 verse 4. And they were all filled. God didn't say, well, I don't want those two or three to have any. No, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, Acts 2 verse 4. Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. I'll give you in my notes in Acts 4. Stephen was in the end of Acts 7. Stephen, filled with the Holy Spirit, said, Okay, Barnabas, a man full of the Holy Spirit, Acts 11, 4. The whole group of believers, when Peter came back after they're talking to by the Sanhedrin, to, or, or by the leaders anyway, to quit preaching in this name, and he, he gave them a talk, and they all prayed, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul says, was filled. Ananias says, God wants you to know you're going to be filled with his Spirit. We're, we're supposed to be filled with the Spirit and not with wine. Acts, that's Ephesians 5.18, Ephesians 5.18. So I'd like that too. I'd like that too. I'd also like to be led by God's Spirit. I'd like to walk in the Spirit. I hope you do too. I'd like to pray in the Spirit as well as with my understanding as Paul explains in 1 Corinthians 14. Now, so pray for those things. So in Acts 2, they were heard speaking in other languages, languages of men in Acts 2, in Acts 2. That is clearly what's taught in this occurrence. I'll read it shortly. They had no need for interpreters. As I would be speaking to them, in front of me they would be hearing, uh, if there was a Chinese person there, a Spanish person, a Russian, a, a, a Czech person, uh, English, uh, all of different languages. Did I leave? Filipino? <laughs> Don't want to leave out my Filipino friends. But anyway, so I would be speaking, let's say, in English but you would all be hearing in your language perfectly what I was saying in your language as if I was speaking it that way. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you that as we read the scriptures here. Later on, though, after this, uh, this occasion of Acts 2, later on, Paul seems to be describing that it wasn't always that way after this. This was a unique event of hearing the speaking in, in, in other languages, uh, hearing your own language. So Paul refers to speak in 1 Corinthians 13, 1. 1 Corinthians 13, 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but don't have love. I'm just making a bunch of noise. I'm just a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And so I'm just annoying noise. And he speaks of making sure that when you speak in a tongue after Pentecost, as is said, make sure you have an interpreter or don't speak in, uh, in a tongue in front of other people. That just becomes showing off in a sense. It doesn't, they don't understand it. And in fact, you don't even understand what you're saying. That's why you need an interpreter. And that's all in 1 Corinthians 14. I'd like to encourage you all to study that chapter. But what happens in Jerusalem on Pentecost is different. Clearly different from the speaking in tongues that happens later on. And later on, interpreters are needed. Later on, it was called speaking in the Spirit or speaking to God, as I'll post in just a second here. But here in Acts 2, the miracle is in the hearing. Let's, let's read it. In Acts 2, verses 5 to 13. There were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them, 120, speak in his own language. And they were all amazed. I don't think they were all standing up there trying to preach to all the group there. I think they probably had fanned out and were speaking to two or three or five or six people uh, individually. Otherwise, it would be total bedlam and confusion. But anyway, because everyone heard them speak in his own language, not the language of angels, not the language of God. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are these not all Galileans? And how is it then that we hear them all each speak in our own language in which we were born? And then they mentioned Parthia, the people from Parthia. I believe that's where many of the ten so-called lost tribes of Israel went. And the Medes, the Elamites, Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, it mentions a whole bunch. In verse 11, Cretans and Arabs. And we hear, verse 12 now, no, still verse 11, we hear them speaking in our own language, in our own tongues. I have it underlined, bolded, so you can find where I am. The wonderful works 
of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocked, saying they're full of new wine. So later on, speaking in tongues like I know was, uh, was in a language unknown to the hearer. So you needed interpreters. But in Acts 2, right here, they clearly were hearing it in their own tongue, in their own language, human tongue, without an interpreter needed. I hope what I'm giving you is exactly what Scripture says. I am not against speaking in tongues, but it has to be according to Scripture. Okay? Later, interpreters were needed, and unless someone was given the gift, not just of speaking in tongues, but someone else given the gift of interpreting, which Paul describes as speaking to God, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2 and 28, or as the tongue of angels, 1 Corinthians 14, 1, uh, 13, 1. So we're warned also, brethren, not to forbid. A lot of you, if you run a group or have a, a, a church group, would not let anybody speak in tongues. Paul tells us, don't forbid the speaking in tongues. It just has to be in a certain uh, orderly way, though, as, I, as I'll read. Anyway, so don't forbid it. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 39 to 40 says that. I'll read it shortly. It should be permitted if only, but if God has given that gift, but only if there's an interpreter, Paul says. So let's start in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2 to 5. I want to make sure you understand the difference between what happened in Acts 2 and what happens in speaking in tongues later on. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2 to 5. For, if, for he who speaks in a tongue or language does not speak to men, but to God. Does not speak to men. For no one understands him. I'm in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2. It should be up there on the screen now. However, in the Spirit, he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies, when he uses the word prophesy, if you use it up, look it up in the Greek, uh, and so on, it, it means speaking under inspiration. It doesn't always mean foretelling something. It means God's inspired you to say something. It could be foretelling or it could be just an inspired message. So he who preaches, if you will, prophesies, speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. They understand what he's saying. But he said in verse 2, but if you speak in a tongue, no one understands you. He says that. Verse 4, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. But he who prophesies edifies everybody else, the church. I wish you all would speak with tongues. So let's find the balance on this. But even more so that you prophesied or speak under inspiration. He who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. So here it seems to imply that you either have to have an interpreter or God's given you the gift of not just speaking in tongues, but to say what I've just said to you means blah, blah, blah. So far I've not been given the gift of speaking in tongues. I have not. Uh, my mom had it, but I do not. I do believe God has given me the gift of inspired teaching, though, and uh, which Paul says is fine. In fact, he says that he likes it better than speaking in tongues. We must also be aware of thinking, as many Pente Pentecostal type people believe, that being able to speak in tongues is the final proof you've actually received God's Holy Spirit. That's too bad because that's not of Scripture. God gives different gifts to different ones. He doesn't give a same gift to everyone. Some have gifts of healing. Some don't. Some have gifts of inspired preaching. Some don't. Some have gifts of understanding, of administration. Uh, the various gifts are listed in Romans 12, by the way, in 1 Corinthians 12, if you want to go study those. So God does not give the same gift to everybody. In fact, Paul does, uh, ex explains that we're one body, but we have different parts. We have a hand, we have ears, we have nose, we have uh, a mouth, and so on. We can't all be a mouth, we can't all be hands. So anyway, verse 1 Corinthians 14, I'll jump to verse 13 now. Therefore let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. But my understanding is unfruitful. I've talked to people who've, who speak in tongues, and uh, they say they love it when they can pray in the Spirit. And I say, well, what are you saying? What, what are you saying? And the answer I always get is, I don't know. I just know I feel real good at the end of it. 
Paul says that here. My understanding is unfruitful. When I pray in a tongue, what's the conclusion then? He says, well, if God leads me to pray in a spirit, I'll pray in the spirit, he says in, here in verse 15. Uh, but I'll also want to pray with my understanding. I'm not just going to pray just in the spirit. I'm going to pray with my understanding as well. So I'll sing with the spirit. There'll be times that God's spirit will just guide and lead that singing. But I'll also sing with my understanding. So he's saying, know the difference between the two. Neither one is bad. Neither one's necessarily, but Paul says, though, speaking with understanding, if you're talking to people, to other people, is preferable in his opinion, led by God. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 18, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. There you have it. Paul had that gift to speak in tongues, speaking in the Spirit with God, with angels. Yet in the church, but if you're all there in front of me, Paul says, I'm in 1 Corinthians 14, 19 now. And I have it bolded here so you can find it. Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with understanding, with my understanding, that I may teach others also, than 10,000 words in a tongue. So Paul is hardly saying this is the end-all, be-all thing you got to have. Paul is clearly saying and implying, don't feel bad if you don't speak in tongues. And you don't have to pray that other people speak in tongues. It's okay. God will give us the gift if he wants to. It's okay not to have that gift. I mean, some of you have the gift of generosity. That's a wonderful gift. I'd love to have that gift. I'm trying to uh, be responsive if that's a gift. Yet in the church, I'd rather speak five words. Okay. Then he gives some rules. If you're going to have speaking in tongues going on, this is long after Acts 2. 1 Corinthians 14, 27 to 28. If anyone speaks in a tongue, verse 27, if anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. He says, if you're going to speak in a tongue in church, I'm setting down the rule, no more than three of you can do it. One at a time, three max. And only if you have an interpreter. That's hardly a Pentecostal meeting. I grew up watching that, seeing that. This is not how they practice it. But if there's no interpreter, at least the ones I've been to, if there's no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. So if there's to be any speaking in tongues going on, it should not descend to any kind of bedlam. There should not be a rolling around on the ground. I mean, the Bible doesn't describe that kind of thing going on. There shouldn't be chaos. There shouldn't be noise and everyone doing it all at once. One at a time, three max, and only if there's an interpreter or don't do it. That's the rules of the Bible. I don't care what else you read in books and stories of other men. These are the rules of the Bible, of God. Now, 1 Corinthians 14, 32 and 33 from the English Standard Version. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So a notion that you can be so filled with God's spirit that you start speaking in tongues, you're slain by the spirit, you're rolling around on the ground, and who knows what else can be seen that you're doing or that you're exposing or what you're, you know, it, it bedlam. And, and people will later say, I don't even remember that. I... I Something came over me and I lost all control. The Bible says the spirits of the prophets are under the speaker's control, are subject to the prophets. Verse 33, for God is not a God of confusion. Now the King James adds the words author of, or the New King James does, but it's not in the original. In this case, God is not the God of confusion and of but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints, all things should be done decently and in order. Now, perhaps I can give an updated sermon that goes in more detail on speaking in tongues. Some of you might like that. But I just want to make sure you understand that what happened in Acts 2 was a very unique uh, set of circumstances. Now in Acts 2, let's get back to it. So they heard them speaking in their own human language without an interpreter. And what they heard was human language. At the same time, simultaneously, 
No interpreter was needed. It was not a tongue of angels. It was not speaking to God. It was speaking to man in language and words that they could understand. Peter gets up and gives his Pentecost sermon. I find it interesting. On this occasion, he glorifies and focuses on the risen Messiah, Yeshua, the Son of God. Peter begins by explaining that in Joel 2, hey, we're not drunk. We've been filled with the Spirit. He quotes from Joel 2 that in the last days, before the great dreadful day of the Lord, God will pour out his Spirit on all flesh, and the young men and old men and the young men, women and young uh, and, and the, the young maid women, um, maid servants, women, and, and so on, they'll all be filled with the Holy Spirit, and they'll all, and uh, anyway, so it, it's all there. You can read it in Acts 2. Obviously, Paul saw women whom he knew, probably Mary, Yeshua's mother, filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, speaking in a tongue in Acts 2 that was heard in other people's languages. So that's why I think he referred to women also receiving God's Spirit and being able to, 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 to understand it. And as he's speaking now, the more and more and more people started coming. I, I, I think they probably had to move outside. If you keep reading it, they, they seem to have moved outside. And uh, there's no way you're going to get 3,000 people in a house. So they moved outside into the temple courtyards probably. And more than three, about 3,000 people were added to the body of believers by the end of Peter's sermon. They were baptized, about 3,000. 3,000 were killed at the first Pentecost at Mount Sinai, or near Pentecost. It wasn't exactly on Pentecost Day anymore, but those were 3,000 who had worshipped the gold calf, and they were slain. On this Pentecost, 3,000 were given life, had come to Yeshua. So anyway, so the Spirit gave them utterance, and this was a unique circumstance in Acts 2. Acts 2.28, after speaking about Joel 2, uh, Peter says this, You have made known to me the ways of life, you will make me full of joy in your presence. I think Psalm 16, the end of it, says there's nothing but joy in God's presence. Uh, do you picture God that way? I sure hope so. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried. His tomb is with us to this day. And therefore, being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of, the, of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up to Christ... He would raise up the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. It's what it means. He's, he's saying David was told, from your descendants will come a Savior, a Messiah, an anointed, especially anointed one. Now, kings were always anointed. Priests were anointed. High priests were. So, but the anointed was the one they were all looking for. They were all anointed ones. They were all messiahs, if you will. That's what, anointed, that's what anointed in Hebrew is, Messiah or Christ, Christos in, in, um, in Greek. But he was looking for the Messiah, the Christ. So he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. Verse 31 now. He foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up of which we're all witnesses. Now, verse 33 now. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received him, uh, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God's Holy Spirit. And it comes through Yeshua. It all starts with God the Father, and then comes through Yeshua. So, sometimes in Romans 8, for example, I think in verse 9, if anyone, or verse 8, uh, let me see what, Romans 8, verse, I think it's verse 8 and 9. If anyone does not have the Spirit uh, of God, he, then he's not, he's not his. Uh, uh, the Spirit of Christ, I think, is mentioned there also. Anyway, I should have looked that up again. But Spirit of Christ, Spirit of God, there's one Spirit, there's one God, there's one Lord, there's one Spirit, there's one body. Ephesians 4, verses 4 to 6 says that. He poured that out. And, okay. So anyway, it says here, the, having received from the Father, verse 33, the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. 
Yeshua, I believe, poured it out now at this point because it comes through him and he becomes the vessel of pouring it out. Um, or it comes from God the Father. I think in this case, Yeshua did. For David did not ascend into the heavens. I'm going to have to give a sermon. What happens when you die? If anyone's in heaven with full cognitive awareness of who and what he is, it would be David. We read earlier, David in verse 30 is both dead and buried. We read now in verse 34, put it up here, for David did not ascend into the heavens. But he himself, David says, the Lord, Yehovah, said to Adonai, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool and all that. At the end of Peter's sermon, that's quoted, by the way, from Psalm 110, verse 1. The, the God who is God most high, the God who rules over the, the world and the universe, is God the Father. And he has given much, or uh, he's given all that to his son also now, and who will conquer everything until he hands it back to God the Father. 1 Corinthians 15, that God, God the Father, may be all in all. So don't leave out the Father. Don't leave out the Father. He remained the God of Israel through the one we now know as Jesus Christ. The, the God, the Jehovah that was seen, had to be the one we know as Yeshua because God says very clearly that no one has seen, Yeshua said that, no one's seen the Father. No one's seen the Father. I think John says that as well in the Gospel of John or, or in, in the book of First John. At the end of Peter's sermon, those from outside who had come in or, 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 or Peter and them were now outside, were cut to the heart, were told to repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit, and they did. 3,000 were added to the congregation. Go on to read it. At the end of Acts 2, you'll see that there was great joy. And over time in Acts 6, verse 7, it says even a lot of priests became faithful to the word and were converted. Even a lot of priests. We read later on, even a lot of Pharisees. We know the main one that we know of is Paul. But there were many who were Pharisees. The problem with priests and Pharisees coming in is they often brought their doctrines and beliefs with them. And where they were off base had to be corrected. So the Pharisees came in teaching in the New Covenant, you still needed to be circumcised, which is not true. So that's why Paul says in Galatians, um, I think it's 5, verse 3 or 4, might be 6, verse 3 and 4, that if you insist on being circumcised for spiritual reasons, you've disqualified you from yourself from grace. So Paul had to learn that and had to teach that to others. The priests who came in often believed there was no resurrection. And so those things, but, but they did come, and God called them into his body. Peter did not address um, anything really beyond all this, anything else except about Yeshua and the Holy Spirit. His two main topics for his day of Pentecost sermon was the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and Yeshua the being the Messiah, who had died and had now risen and taken up to the right hand of God. For time's sake, I'm going to have to ask you all to please hear my sermon last year, uh, Pentecost 2020, fivefold meaning of Pentecost, the fivefold meaning of Pentecost, for much more details about the full meaning of the day. But Peter himself, that's all he did. Now, for example, uh, last year I went into detail about Exodus 19 and 20, 21, 24, uh, how the fire engulfed the mountain, Mount Sinai. Certainly the top of it was all ablaze and a great furnace like a big column of smoke going up to heaven. And it was all ablaze. And Mount Sinai, which is in Arabia, as Galatians 4 tells us, Mount Sinai, which is in Arabia, not the Mount Sinai in what we call the Sinai Peninsula. Anyway, hot, fire and lightning was everywhere. Fire and lightning was everywhere. The mountain was on fire. And Moses was called to go to the top of that mountain. I, I personally, I don't hear other people saying it, but the Bible says the mountain top was on fire. And I, the Bible says God called Moses up to where God was at the top of the mountain in the fire. And so I believe fully that Moses, 
Talk about his faith. Had to totally believe to walk right in through that fire and obey his orders to come up. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and so on. Anyway, so what are, and, and so here in Acts 2, you have fire again. Cloven, cloven fire that divides up, splits up and on top of each one. And you have wind and mighty wind and lightning and thundering going on back in the original Pentecost in, Acts, in Exodus. If I say Acts 19, I mean Exodus 19. Now, I also covered in the sermon uh, last time, and I'll just mention it briefly here a little bit as we end up here, uh, the two loaves of leavened bread that were offered by the priests. Leviticus 23, 17. You shall bake for yourselves two loaves of wheat, of leavened bread, leavened wheat. And they were raised up to heaven. They were raised up to heaven and then brought back down again. What did that mean? Why were they leavened? And they were called of your first fruits. They were the first fruits after Christ. Christ is the first of the first fruits. And then the rest of us being called now are also called first fruits all through the Bible. And I'll put all those notes in my, in my sermon here uh, later on when I come to that part about us being first fruits again. In Matthew 22, verse, verse, uh, verses 1 to 10, Yeshua gives a parable where he talks about how there's a certain king who wants to put on a wedding for his son. A wedding for his son. Let's read it. Matthew 22, verses 1 and 2. Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. Who's the son? We know who that is. Has to be Yeshua. So who's the king? Has to be God the Father. God our Father. Who puts on the wedding? The king does. Where is the king? In heaven. What's a parable a parable of? The kingdom of heaven. What happened to those two wave loaves? They were raised up and then brought back down again. When would that happen? It happened on Pentecost. Who did it happen to? It happened to those represented by the first fruits wheat. Who are called first fruits? You and I are. James 1.18 and many other places call us first fruits. Who are those standing on the sea of glass in Revelation 14, the first four verses? 144,000 in verse 4 says they are, these are the first fruits. So, are you getting the connection to the, to the two loaves? We're now sharing in Christ's glory. We're up there in heaven. Either, and we're there to be part of the wedding supper. And we're there either as a guest or as part of the bride. In every wedding I've ever officiated at or been to or been a part of, the bride and groom were in by far the minority compared to all the others who were there. But there will be others at the wedding supper besides the bride and groom. Please go back and hear the sermons I have called Wedding of the Lamb, part one, two, and three. Just type in Wedding of the Lamb, Wedding of the Lamb in uh, the search bar and you'll see what I mean. So we'll be there either as a guest or as part of the bride. And the bride will be the Israel of God. Israel of God is the church now composed not just of Israel, but of people all around the world. If you're Chinese or Russian or Filipino, Mexican, Venezuelan, Canadian, or one of the island people, it won't matter. If you accept Yeshua as your savior, and God gives you of his seed, of his nature, of his power, of his spirit. What's power? <laughs> of his power, okay. Of his very presence. We're all one, we're told in Galatians 3, verses 26 to 28. We're all one in Christ. So we will marry him or be there as guests. And if you want to read a description of the bride of Christ, read Psalm 45, verses 13 to 15. The, the, the bride, all glorious, and she's given in this beautiful co coat of many colors, and all, you know, it's all describing there. And she has her attendants with her. What a beautiful story. So our own marriage is supposed now to be a picture of the marriage of Christ and his bride. Our marriage is supposed to picture, I'm supposed to picture Christ, so I'm supposed to be servant leader. 
I'm supposed to be loving and kind and sweet and still leading, still being the leader, the head of the house, but in a way that doesn't make it so hard for my wife to submit and respect me. And the wife, of course, picturing the church, submit to your husbands as you would to Christ, the head of the church. It's all in Ephesians 5. Nobody preaches that anymore, it seems. Because I'm not hearing it out there. I'm preaching it. It's in the Bible. So my marriage is supposed to picture that. I'm not some big tyrant, domineering kind of person. I'm not supposed to be. I'm supposed to be picturing the marriage of Christ in the church. One man, one woman, one body. Paul, in talking about the marriage, says it's a mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. That's Ephesians 5, 32. So what does Satan do? He does everything in his power to destroy, to destroy what God has chosen to represent him. So the, the, the rainbow in the sky has now been ambushed, taken over by anything but what represents God and his ideals. Marriage. Can live together now? Can be same sex? No, no. No, it can't. So more, more details on Pentecost in my other sermons. Satan's attacking marriage. He's attacking manhood. He's attacking male and female. He's attacking everything we understand. Changing the definitions of words and everything like that that we understand. And that's what, that's what the false leaders will do. So anyway, so we're getting ready to see the son be married when, he, when God sends his son to rule the earth, conquer all the rebellion for a thousand years. So here are my sermons on wedding of the lamb. Oh, brethren, we need to get excited about it. We need to be part of it. We need to be seeking God as never before. This needs to be real to us. You don't know when you're going to die. And so, I mean, with our next heartbeat, we could be dead. I could be. You could be. We need to be accepting the calling joyfully. If you go on reading Matthew 22, you'll see that one by one, or bunches of them had other reasons. No, I just bought some cattle, some horses, some land. I'm getting married. I, have, I can't. I can't come. My mind's focused on other things. Is what they say. And God gets angry at that. And finally, he just says to them, go and gather whoever you find. In the byways and highways, in the bushes, wherever they are. Good and bad. And bring them to my wedding. I think it says that, but good and bad. <laughs> but whoever you find. Matthew 22. So don't be giving excuses why you don't want to be ready for the wedding. Please, trim your oil lamps. Please, be asking for more oil. Don't be like the... Ten, all ten virgins were sleeping. We must not be asleep. Half of the ten virgins had run out of oil or were, or were running out. We don't need to be in that situation. If we're praying, Father in heaven, pour out your spirit to me and to my wife and to our family and to, our, to, your, to your people here. Why can't we pray first thing in the day? If you get up and you turn your cell phone on first thing, Seek you first the kingdom of God. Put that phone down. Don't look at it till you prayed and sought God first. Don't get up and have your cup of coffee and turn on the news and, and then all these other distractions fill your mind. Seek you first the kingdom of God. Call response to the call of God. Please, please do. We, we've got to put him first and, and throughout the day. So the first resurrection, I believe also, and the wedding of the Lamb. I really believe it's going to happen on Pentecost. I believe just as Israel married God on Pentecost. And Ruth and Boaz was certainly very near Pentecost. It's at the end of the barley harvest. And the Pentecost picture is the first fruits of the wheat. And so um, it's very, very, very close to that period of time. Picturing Christ and his bride, Christ and the church. There are pointing to the reality. So in my opinion, it's very, very likely that we will also be married. We will also be married uh, to Christ on Pentecost. He's marrying first fruits. The church, which is the bride of Christ, are called first fruits. James 1.18 is the best known one. I'll put in my notes here many, many more. Leviticus 23, 10 to, uh, 10 to 20. I'm not sure if I'm getting a glare from the my glasses here, I hope not. 
I'm getting distracted as I see myself there. But anyway, Leviticus 23, 10 to 20, Exodus 23, uh, verse 16 and 19, uh, first fruits are depicted by Pentecost. And um, not the fall holy days. Not the fall holy days. For years and years, I too was taught and believed that the resurrection, the first resurrection, happens on the Feast of Trumpets. After all, it says trumpets, the seventh trumpet. But there were trumpets blown on all the holy days. Where did that voice come from? Woo! <laughs> there were trumpets blown on all the holy days. And so, and first fruits is pictured by Pentecost. Feast of Trumpets pictures those, the big harvest that comes later. So anyway, I really, really believe that, um, and, and I do have a lot of detail proving when, where, who, and what uh, in my three series on marriage of the Lamb, wedding of the Lamb. Maybe it's called marriage of the Lamb or wedding of the Lamb, whatever. So we know the, that's what the first fruits picture. So anyway, I hope we're seeking our King and our God, our beloved King, our beloved husband-to-be as, as frequently as we can as frequently as we can, to, and uh, talking frequently, not just God our Father. Jesus did teach us, when you pray, say, Father in heaven. I don't just say, dear God. I say, Father, Daddy, Abba, in heaven, as instructed. But also speak to the, to the one you're going to marry. What bride out there only talks to the father of the man she's going to marry? So Stephen prayed to Yeshua for Jesus. Acts 7, 59, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit as he was dying. Lord Jesus, and who stood up for him? Give, him? give him honor. He saw, I see Jesus, Son of God, standing on the right hand of God. John prayed at the end of Revelation 22, verse 20, Come, Lord. That's to Jesus. 1 Corinthians 16, 22, O Lord, come. So there are lots of examples of praying to Yeshua, and it just makes sense that my primary, at least when I start the prayer, is to God the Father, Father in heaven. Then as I pray, as I go through it, I say, and Yeshua, I want to talk to you too. Boy, do I thank you. Boy, do I need you in my life. Boy, do I need you filling my life and my soul and my spirit. Boy, do I need your thoughts to fill my mind. Boy, do I need you and love you. And I want to respect you. Everything I do must be respectful of you. Please be patient with me as I try to let you lead my life more and more. I talk to him like that. And I, I say to you all, pray to God the Father. Also include Yeshua. Not just in his name do you pray, but pray to him sometimes. So yes, be talking to our beloved Yeshua. He is our beloved. Ecclesiastes, right? So, I mean, Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon. Beloved master, beloved husband. So anyway, a very, very exciting day. So many things we could still keep talking about, but I need to wrap it up. The gifts of the Spirit, bearing the fruit of the Spirit, walking in the Spirit. All of the things, all the things about the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit does. There, I have sermons on all of those. So go back and check it out. And uh, last year's sermons, sermons before that, just use the search bar. Holy Spirit, Pentecost, different things. Here are those two. Anyway, so Father in heaven, we thank you again so much for this wonderful, wonderful day. And Yeshua, our Savior, the picturing our marriage to you. Oh, Yeshua, please come. Father in heaven, send the Son. Let's get this present world's way over with. Let it happen. Let us be ready. Don't let us be holding it back. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with obedience to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the meaning of this wonderful, wonderful Feast of Pentecost. To Yeshua's honor and glory and to you, Father in heaven, God most high. Amen and amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya. 
providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.